Morning everybody, I hope you are doing well. We are back in the book of Acts and we are going to be starting off uh, in chapter 28. Can you believe it? We are in the final chapter. We're not going to finish it this week. I, I, I was battling <laughs> whether we should do it or not, but um, I think we're just going to just tackle the first 16 verses this morning. But um, before we get there, um, I don't know if you know the, the well-known, it's quite a well-known children's story of Winnie the Pooh um, and uh, Piglet and Eeyore and Christopher Robin and all of those kind of things. Um, I grew up with that kind of thing. My mom used to read it to me. It's, um, it's such a beautiful story, but the characters that come out are amazing. Right. Um, I think our, our favorite character is obviously Pooh Bear. He's this optimistic, um, nothing can fail kind of bear. We've got Eeyore, which uh, everybody loves to, loves to hate. He's the pessimistic, just some would call him realist in this world. Uh, he's always just uh, marked off and I'm going to concentrate on him in, in a bit because he's just like this um, solemn person, you know. And then we've got Christopher Robin, who's more like Pooh and he's just like super optimistic in life. And then we've got Piglet, who's like this timid little pig that just wants to like, you know, you sneeze and he just runs behind a tree or something like that. And uh, I think there's been a lot of philosophy um, drawn out by, by this uh, children's story. But um, it, this, this person, Eeyore, I once saw this meme of, of Eeyore. And Eeyore had these rose-tinted glasses on, right? And, he, and you know, Eeyore's just always, his ears are slouched down. And you say, morning, Eeyore. And he'll say, is it a good morning? And then, you know, he's just this always pessimistic guy. And anyway, I saw this, this meme of, of him with rose-tinted glasses and there was a, like a little grin coming out of, <laughs> underneath his, his, um, his mouth over there. And, and, and I thought to myself, that's what it is. It's, it's when you put your rose-tinted glasses on, things look better. But I don't know if you remember last time when we were in chapter 27, we said that Paul's journey to Rome on the ship and the storm was like a metaphor for life, right? And um, you might be saying to me, it's so cliche. Actually, if you look at my life right now, it's going quite well. Um, maybe things in business is going good. The family is great. Um, and that's great. But we know that one common denominator amongst believers and unbelievers and the whole human race is suffering, right? and hardships and trials because eventually somehow we're always going through struggles. John Piper, he says we're either in it, leaving it or entering hardships. <laughs> um, John Suffering Piper, that's what uh, Rena and I joke about, but uh, he's a real, he's real about how God uses our sufferings and we're going to get a little bit into that today. But um, I think you would agree with me if we look at the world that we are in right now. Things are a bit crazy, right? Um, the moment seems uh, things are a bit unpredictable. The outcome is uncertain. Um, there's just a whole lot of factors, right? And uh, it was interesting that once they were interviewing uh, many of the people that survived World War II concentration camps, they said it wasn't the strongest or the most well-fed that survived. It was those that had purpose and meaning for life. They had a different outlook or a perspective to their circumstances. And it leads me to think of the story back in Numbers 14 when Joshua is about, um, or sorry, Moses uh, sends the 12 um, spies into the promised land and um, they go and uh, scout it out and they bring back these big, um, it was a, like, I think a big tross of, of, of grapes, uh, a bunch of grapes and they, and they said, they came with a report, they're giants in the land, but the, the land is fruitful and it's good. And um, what happened is from the 12 tri uh, spies, there were two that had a good report and there were 10 that had a bad report, right? And the two that had a good report, they were seeing it through the promises of God. Their perspective going into the promised land was like, yes, there's giants in the land. Yes, we look like locusts compared to them. But God has promised us these things. And therefore, we will be able to go into the promised land. But the ten had a negative report. 
and they brought down the whole perception, the whole morale of the, of the people of Israel were, were, were affected by these 10 bad reports. And, and, and I think just so many times that when our outlook and our perspective in the storms of life governs whether we master the storm or the storm masters us. And I want to be bold in, in a way in saying that the, 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 the things that we are facing in the world today is not necessarily a struggle for who and what is right, but it's a struggle for perspective. And if we're looking through the lenses, <laughs> God doesn't have these uh, amazing rose-tinted lenses. He has His lenses that we, He wants us to um, look through, right? His perspective. Or we're looking through the world's perspective, and we might be filled with anxiety. We might be filled with fear. And so I want to um, push the rewind button quickly, push it on uh, the rewind button and go back quickly to Acts chapter 27, verse 27. And I want to read these um, the, 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 from verse 27 to 32 quickly. So turn there and uh, it starts off like this. And then I'm going to pray for us. When the, when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. A little further on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run onto the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes and the ship's boat of the ship's boat and let it go. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word on its own is anointed and it is special Lord Jesus it's filled with the Holy Spirit it's not just black ink on white page it is powerful it is able to change our lives and when it is it is it comes into contact with the Holy Spirit it is the the the, the possibilities are endless you turn sinners to you Jesus you make um, lepers are healed when you speak, Jesus. And so we want your words to be elevated this morning. We want your words, Lord Jesus, to be more powerful than anything else, Lord. The promise is to, 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 to break through the facade of our lives and into the depths of our hearts, Lord Jesus, so that we would be resolute and stand firm in the storms of life. And so, God, we pray this. Would you do this and lead me? Father God, I pray, use me this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. And so after 14 days at sea, after 14 days, storm tossed, eventually they hear the, 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 the waves breaking against the distant shore. Sailors, I think they just have this perception, you know, they just have this intuition, right? And they know, and they start dropping off the, um, these ropes with these anchors and they're taking the, the, the meetings of how, how far the ocean floor is away from the boat. And it seems to be getting shorter and shorter, right? And as they realize this, there's a great relief that comes into their hearts. They're like, yes, uh, finally our, our storm-tossed adventure is coming to an end. But it also comes with a little bit of a reality. We can't see the waves and we can't see the rocks that we're moving towards, right? And so what happens is, is that um, Paul had previously, uh, a couple of days earlier, he had given this promise of the Lord when the angel met with him. The promise was that not one person would die on the boat. Only the boat would be um, would be lost. He even said not one hair would perish from 276 people. Amazing promise, right? And um, as it was confirmed that they were, they were drawing near, some of the sailors got a bit anxious, right? And um, they, they decided to pull out four anchors from the stern of the, bo uh, the boat just to try and 
kind of anchor the boat and hope to keep the boat still for a while so that when um, dawn came and the, and the sun came up, um, they would be able to, to kind of find out where they are, but hopefully keep the boat from running onto the rocks. But some sailors in the, in the early hours of the morning, they were getting fearful. And so they jumped into the boat, right? They lowered the boat in the pretense. They were saying, no, we're going to lay out more anchors uh, on the bow of the boat, right? But they were going to escape. Paul sees this moment and um, he says uh, that uh, he says to the centurion, he says, unless these men stay on the ship, you cannot be saved. He reminds them of the promise. You guys need to stay on the ship, right? But you can understand these guys. The land is so close. 14 days has been so long. I shared with you a little bit uh, two weeks ago about my journey. I'm like, I would want to get off that boat. I totally understand them. And, and waiting is just not maybe an option for these men. And so I need to get off this thing, right? And so they lost sight at this moment of God's promises, a perspective of what God wanted them to promise. You stay on the boat. That is the promise, right? And so seeing things through their circumstances, the lenses of their circumstances and through fear, they, they, they jumped off the boat, right? And they wanted to go. And then Paul reminds them, and so they cut off the ropes. And it's a beautiful analogy because at this moment in time, their, their, their backup plan was floating away. There was no other way of getting off that boat except through trusting in God's promise. And it was an amazing moment. And so I think there's, a, there's three things that, that, uh, that we are called to as a church through this. And that's why I wanted to rewind a little bit. And so, because the church is called to stay close, to stay in the boat. And that, and that the whole picture is staying close to Jesus, right? To not make our own plans, lowering the dinghy and trying to make it to the land ourselves, a plan B or something like that. No, we trust. And it's a call for us as uh, the church and people of God to cut the rope of anything that is causing us to not trust Jesus, right? Unless we stay in the ship and stay connected to Jesus, we will not be saved. And that is the message of the Bible. We trust in God's promises. We lean not on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge Him. And He will straighten our paths. That's the promise. And, and, and thirdly, we, we trust in the promise of God. Those, those are the promises. Even when things don't look like they are going to work out, there are numerous accounts within all of the Old Testament and in the New Testament through Paul and all of these that at the last moment when things didn't look like they were going to come work through Christ came through God came through and I was just reminded in Ephesians 5 the, with regards to the promises of in God's word um, it says to husbands but the analogy is, is what Christ is doing it says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her it says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What the church of Christ needs right now and in from the beginning of time and from, from even in the circumstances now is the Word of God. That is what washes us. That is what prepares us for our bridegroom. That is what we need to be focusing on. The, the Word that trusts His, His promises to us and His Holy Spirit that illuminates these promises to us and guides us through the storm. That's why I think um, um, Ben's uh, message last Sunday in Romans 14 was so spot on and I enjoyed it. And um, Monty and I were just chatting now, actually, that it was just, it was anointed as well. I was listening to it after, after my weekend off. I, I was just, it was like God was there, right? And, and the, the focus was, is that we can be focusing on all the little divisions and the little factions and the little uh, things that we consider unclean and you consider clean. And, and it's a faith issue and it's a conviction if, issue, really. It's what we are convicted with, but we're not used, meant to use our freedom to break down those that feel convicted about those certain issues. And so it's a reminder that in this time that we are where there's more division, 
The world is divided. It's always been divided, but now even now, I, I sense it, it, that there's even more division within, even within the church, right? And, 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 and it's going around um, doctrines and it's going around vaccines and it's going around um, corona regulations and all of these things. And yet we need to be focused on the main thing. Matthew 24, when Jesus kind of speaks into the last days and um, we know that um, we're even encouraged in the moment that we are in, is that the last days are approaching quickly. And it's amazing. Some of us, uh, and um, I'd be, and so we, the, the generation that we live in is a blessed generation. And so verse 45 of chapter 24, it says, when it is, so who then is the faithful and wise servant who is, who his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if the wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards, the master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. At an hour he does not know and he will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Encouragement for us at this moment in time is not to be focused on all the little divisions, but to be focused on what God has called us to be. And that's His bride, purified by His word and busy with what He's given us. Blessed is the servant that when the master comes back, he finds him doing what he's called him to do and not to nitpick and not to take out things. And so... The last little thing I wanted to say is that these now, this analogy from chapter 24 and from even chapter 27 in the book of Acts um, is that the, it, Jesus talks about a household and Paul talks about the ship. And I, and I want to say is that a, a house is where a family dwells together. A ship is where the crew and the sailors, if you're off the ship, then you're, 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 you're separated from the boat. And you're 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 on your, your your own, kind of navigating the seas on your own. And um, we're not all as as believers on separate boats, kind of making our own way. We're on one boat. We're in one household. And the encouragement for us is that Christ has designed Christians to be together, be in the boat together, be in the household together. Right? It's a scary to be in a small boat on the ocean on your, on your own navigating for yourself trying to work out where where we should be going um and and and, and i know at the moment in time i was chatting with some boys um a couple of a week ago um at, at a school and we were talking about identity in god and and um and we were chatting a little bit about just the world where we at and and the and and the westernized civil is western kind of viewpoint of individualism and how um the world now is, is communicating to our young people and to even to all of us is that forge your own way, find your own way, plot your own course. You are the master of your own destiny. And I don't believe that that's God's way. God has called us to be under his authority. He is the one that is commanding the vessel. He is the one that is giving direction. And so the encouragement to us as a church is just let us let Christ, let's let Christ, our champion, fight our struggles for us. Let him take us through the storm. Let us just as, a, as the bride of Christ cling to Jesus, cling to his promises and let him carry us through this time. And so let's get into chapter 28 verses 1 and we're going to read the first six verses together. And it says, so after we were brought safely through, safely through the storm, we then learned that the island was called Malta. And the native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, 
justice has now allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. So they arrive on Malta, and they arrive just on this island, and they find learn out from obviously from the, the, the natives and those that are there that they're on this island of Malta, and they get some un, uh, um, what they say unusual kindness. They get some kindness. The, the natives make this big bonfire, and they warmed up right over there. But Malta is 950 kilometers west of Crete, where they started, right? So if you divide 950 divided by 14 days, they had traveled on an average of 68 kilometers per day to the west of Crete, right? And they came to the small little island of Malta, right? It, they, could have, they could have bypassed Malta on either side, but God had led them. But this storm was crazy for them without a sail or anything, just by drifting, they had traveled 68 kilometers a day. That was how crazy the storm was, right? So, Malta is about 90 kilometers south of Sicily um, in the Mediterranean Sea. And so, um, what happens is, is that um, they, they, the, the people of the island see the shipwreck and they see them in the early hours of the morning as they come in and they kindle this big fire and they show them kindness. And we see in verse 3 the work ethic of Paul. Paul has now, for 14 days, been encouraging the sailors. He has um, just been there motivating them. He's been there instructing them. And what does he do? He doesn't, he's, <laughs> I was thinking of this. Paul is like Ben. Ben can't sit still. He's got to just always be doing stuff. And, and this is what Paul is saying. He's just like come through the surf. He's crawled up the beach and they seize the fire and they, they're making. Um, and he goes, well, I'm just going to go and get some sticks, right? And he gathers some sticks and he throws it onto the fire. And what happens is, is that he's obviously picked up this viper or this, this snake. In, in the bi biblical terms, a viper just means it was a poisonous snake right and he picks up this and he throws it in and naturally the, the the snake comes out of the the heat and and he latches onto paul's arm and it's just it's hanging there maybe it's strapped around there and uh it's it's wrapped around his arm and uh the locals see this um this this situation and paul just kind of shakes this thing off and goes into the flames and the people go paul must be a murderer right He's maybe done something severely wrong because he's, because he's escaped death in the ocean. And now this justice that they're talking about is like this goddess justice that is now not allowing him to escape death will now bring justice to Paul by bringing a viper. And so they're waiting. They kind of just are waiting um, for Paul um, to, to kind of just fall over. And, and you just got to admire Paul right now. I mean, going through all of this ordeal, he's, he's, he's been beaten up by his own countrymen, he's ordealed um, a court case, he's now chained to a Roman citizen, and now he's gone through a 14-day storm-tossed cruise, and now he crawls up the beach, and then he gets bitten by a snake. You'll be like, come on, Lord, can you not just give me a break over here? You know, but he doesn't. He doesn't go, why, Lord? Can't this, you know, I can't take this anymore. Can you just see, can't you see I'm serving you? But, but Paul just kind of just shakes this off, you know. And he goes, and, and Paul's attitude is amazing. Um, at work, uh, uh, at my previous uh, job, before I came and worked for the church, um, my, uh, my brother-in-law, Twerby, had this saying. He said, um, attitude governs aptitude. Attitude governs your ability to do something, right? And so Paul's attitude was so amazing. He says, he just carries on. And, and, um, and so the natives are just watching and waiting and watching, waiting for him to, to kind of collapse. And, and this, is, this is a funny thing because he doesn't collapse. And so their whole perspective of him changes. And they say, oh, 
he's no longer a murderer. He must be a god. And it's kind of similar to what had happened in Lystra back in chapter 14 in Acts. Um, it kind of worked opposite those when Barnabas had healed this man. They thought that he was um, Hermes and, and, and Barnabas was Zeus and they wanted to worship him. right? And then in the end what happened is that they wanted to worship him, but then they resulted in stoning him. And, that, and, the, and the same kind of situation happens here is they wanted to condemn him of being a murderer and now they want to make him a god, right? And what's interesting, though, is that they weren't wrong about the accu accusations of Paul. Paul was a murderer. Paul had murdered innocent Christians. And he was the one that stood us at, um, at the side of those that were stoning Stephen, right? <laughs> in a way, they were, in, in a way, quite prophetic, right, over here. But the, but the way Paul worked with that accusation was that he just shook it into the fire and we might ask the question why didn't paul swell up right there's, there's a couple of reasons there's three reasons actually one is that jesus promised paul that paul will get to rome so paul in that moment could have just been like viper uh, i'm meant to be going to rome it's not it's just really not a good time right now viper get into the fire <laughs> i'm gonna go to rome um, or Jesus had promised this in Luke 10, 19 and Mark 16, 18. Um, if you read, I'm going to read this quickly. It says, Behold, I have given you authority to, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall hurt you. Jesus said uh, this in Mark 16. He said, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands. And if they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Guzik says, David Guzik, he says, By extension, by putting this into our role right now it says that we see that the divine justice had no more claim against Paul it had all been satisfied by Jesus work on the cross God's justice could never harm Paul nor anyone who has had all his or her sin paid for by the work of Jesus on the cross right it didn't matter if Paul was guilty or not. All that mattered is what Christ had done. It didn't matter what Paul had done in his past. It had, was it mattered what Christ had done on the cross. It was amazing. I had this privilege um, uh, a couple of uh, two weeks ago. I went with Johann Grunewald um, to uh, into uh, his ministry um, to the prisoners. And um, I spent the morning with them, and it was so amazing. Um, I made this joke with my, uh, my sons. I said to them on the, Tuesday, the Thursday morning, I said to him, Boys, you must say goodbye to me, because Daddy's going to go to prison. And uh, Ethan looked at me in big eyes, and he was like, I could just see him. He's like, Daddy's done something really wrong. <laughs> you know, I, said, I said, no, I'll see you a little bit later. Don't worry. Um, I'm just going to go with Uncle Johan. But it was an amazing time because I saw these guys that were criminals. And, um, and, and, and that's our prejudice from us on the outside. We see their criminal status because they are there, right? Our criminal status doesn't get seen. Our sin doesn't get seen. But their sin is obvious. But I saw a whole bunch of men that had been forgiven, trusting Jesus for their salvation. They were free men. And the, the ironic part of it is, is that I know in my own life and many Christian lives, is that in prison there, the whole I saw a whole lot of free men sitting in jail, right? But they, because of trusting Jesus, they were living in true freedom. Meanwhile, back outside, there's a whole bunch of free Christians bound by shame and previous guilt of, uh, or guilt of previous sin. And that's not Christ's design and design for us. Paul lived in the reality that his sin was paid for, past, present, and future. And so the shrugging off of, of, of the serpent into the fire was a picture, picture of, 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 uh, of 
Satan's strategy to try and get Paul. Maybe Satan wanted to get into P P uh, Peter. <laughs> I'm on to Peter. Um, get into Paul's mind on the beach. He knew maybe he was a bit much from 14 days at sea, and, and he and he wanted to get play a mind strategy with him and, and, and remind Paul of the guilt and the shame uh, of bringing these accusations upon him. Right. But Paul knew his strategy. Uh, Paul knew that he was clean. And Paul would later write in Ephesians 1 verse 7, he said, In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And beautiful John writes in chapter 20, Revelation 20 verse 10, he says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. And sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and that's the truth Paul was just able to shake off right and um, I think in many ways this is how this picture of how Satan so often makes us as Christians ineffective um, because he fills our mind with condemnation and guilt from past sin. And we need to be re reminded that once and for all, Christ has finished it. It's not about what you have done. When we have come to Christ and confessed our sins and we continually do that, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all right unrighteousness. Right? That's the promise. And so we live free lives. And us as fathers, we don't have a list of sins of our sons or our daughters, right? At least some of us don't. <laughs> um, we want to have freedom. We want them to come onto our lap. We don't think of all the lists of, uh, of, before you come and give me a hug, I just want to remind you about these things. No, and that's the heart of the father too. He's dealt with our sins so that we can have hugs and kisses and encouragement and joy and, and instruction. And so that's the picture. Verse 7 goes on and it says, And now, in the neighborhood of that, that place, there um, were lands belonging to the chief man of the island. And the chief man just means, it's not like he was some chief and he had like this... Um, grass dress on or something like that um, it meant that he was the representative for, for Rome and his name was Populus right Publius who received us and entertained us, hospi uh, us hospitably for three days it happened that the father of Publi uh, Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery and Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him healed him and when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also um, honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. So Paul, um, kind of this, this new kind of condition that, that, or not condition, these people thought Paul was a god. And so they introduced him to Publius, the chief um, man for Rome on the island. And um, he entertains them. And that's amazing because God just provides for his servants just right there. <laughs> Their whole ordeal and now he just gives them three days of absolute um, entertainment and, uh, and uh, enjoyment. Probably had good food. But what I want us to see over here is that because Paul had been bitten by a snake, because Paul had, um, had been led to, to Malta, Paul was, God was now led Paul to the chief um, a man of the island and it wasn't just so that Paul could have a good time there and be entertained God wanted Paul to minister to Publius's father right and when Paul prayed for and it's amazing because if you look at this um, dysentery it's a it's a horrible disease where you have chronic diarrhea and it's severe abnormal uh, abdominal uh, abdominal pain and people often die of just di uh, of dehydration of malnutrition right and Paul, just so brave in that moment with all just infections or whatever, he just, he just lays his hands upon um, this Publius' father and he's healed, he's cured, right? And, um, and, and then as a result of that, now all of a sudden Paul has now got a ministry to all the ill. And it's amazing, this, the interesting piece in the section 
is that um, verse 8 talks, uh, and if you've got a New King James Version, it's word, use of the word healed, right? Paul laid on his hands on Publius' father and he was healed. And then it says, all those in the island that were sick and diseased came to Paul and they were healed. Uh, the ESV says cured, right? But the two Greek words that are different, if you see them in healed and healed, right? Um, verse 8 means that it was, they were made whole at once, right? But verse 9, um, there was therapeo is the Greek word. And it means to serve, to do service, to wait upon menially like a servant, right? Like a doctor would, right? And so the analogy here, or what we might see here, is maybe Luke, the physician who was with Paul, Paul, the beloved physician of Paul. Perhaps this was the first missionary hospital um, uh, in history, right? On the island of Malta. And so this analogy was that they had a ministry, ministry to sick people. They didn't just once off pray and they were healed, but they were now made, um, they could serve these people, right? And the amazing thing in this whole story is that God uses a storm and a snake bite to turn it um, to all into ministry and a blessing to the community. God uses a storm to take Paul to Malta, he uses a snake to lead him to the chief man of Malta, which led him to pray for his father, which led him to minister to all the sick on Malta and three months of ministry. And I want to say is that um, God is able to use our trials and our storms. He uses our storms to lead us to ministry, to loving other people. And I was reading this week um, of this uh, an example of Joni Erickson Tada. And she is an old story back in the 1960s. But she was, as a young woman, she dived into some water and she, and she must have hit something with her neck or on her head and she was paralyzed, right? And today she shares encouraging stories of how she trusted God, right? Another example, and you guys all know, know this, um, this Nick Vujicic, I think I pronounced it, it's totally wrong. But uh, he's the guy, the Australian guy, no legs, no arms, no worries. It's amazing testimony. This was how he was born. And, and he just shares with young people and old people, he's written books of just how, even how God, through his trial of just dealing with how God made him, he now encourages others, right? And so the encouragement is, is that with all of us, we have stories. And we shouldn't be ashamed of our storms and our steak bites, our past guilt, right? They give us the ability to speak into other people's lives. And I was chatting to some people this week even, just, and they were sharing with us their, their journey and how God had opened up doors for her to speak into other people's lives and be encouraged. And I was thinking of Hannes Fisser, who's just a long journey with, um, with his business and how to trust God. And, and just when money wasn't there, God provided at the last moment. And these things speak into other people and encourages us and encourages Christians to hang on and hold on to God's promises. And so... What happens, in, and I know we're getting a little bit on, so I, I want to um, speed ahead. It says, verse 11 says, And after three months they set sail um, in a ship that had wintered in the island, and a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as the uh, figurehead. Putting in at Sycrocuse, uh, <laughs> we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day, we came to Petioli. And there was, we found brothers, and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And as we came to Rome, and, um, and, and as we came to Rome, and so, sorry, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appeal, uh, Appius, and three taverns to meet us. On, uh, on seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came, into, we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who got him. And so eventually God's promises were fulfilled and Paul arrived in Rome. True to God's promises, Paul had arrived. And, and um, there's a couple of things, and maybe we'll look at this next week. But I think for time's sake, let's just um, pray together. Um, ask the Lord to bless this word. Father God, we thank you so much for looking into this, this um, section of scripture and just being reminded that uh, us as a church, 
us as a people of God, us as, as individuals are called to stay in the boat, Lord. Stay trusting you, Lord, to cut off our B plans, our backup plans. Lord, you called us to, to stick together and to, to be encouraged by one another. Thank you, Lord, that you use our sufferings, our struggles, our storms, our past guilt, our snake bites, Lord, to, to lead us to ministry, Lord. Lord, please make us aware of what you have given us in our past to be a, a good encouragement to others. Build up your church now, we pray, Jesus. Encourage them by your word alone. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good Sunday.